Yeah, he, he really. But that isn't the end. Right. That isn't the end of it. You, it's an accident. You see, that's the second generation that thinks of money as an end. Yeah. Uh, the, the first generation the oligarch is the man who makes the money as an accident to this great service that he performs for the for the society. It, but it's a utilitarian service. That is it, uh, and and the automobile is, is something like the perfect example. We we can think uh, of, of course, the United States uh, has been up until now, up until the 1930s, anyway. I think Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, was the first really democratic man uh, to uh, come into. Uh, well, I could be wrong. I don't know all that much about Amer American history. When I say first, I could be wrong, but he was certainly the one who turned the tide. Uh, uh, of the uh, from there on in, we were headed toward the democratic man. That is the, what we call the welfare state. Before that, the United States was most famous in the world for being an oligarchic society. And Henry Ford isn't the only one. Uh, do you remember Thomas A. Edison? Uh, <clears throat> the, the inventor of the electric light and the inventor of the phonograph and the inventor of, I don't know, everything. Why, didn't, didn't he invent everything? Uh, that is, uh, the, that idea of uh, discovering and uh, finding out a new way of doing something because it's practical and because it works. Efficient. And efficient and it helps people. We had, uh, oh, I remember this from my childhood in school because these were the heroes that we were supposed to celebrate. Henry Ford, uh, Thomas Edison, Luther Burbank, you remember, mm -hmm. who experimented with um, plants and made, uh, invented the cross between the peach and the, uh, and the plum. Well, what do you call those things? Uh, he, he grafted uh, yeah. uh, different plants together. Uh, the inventor, the, the, the uh, 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 scientific experimenter, is one of the oligarchic types, uh, and not just the money, not just the money man. Uh, the, the, the Bell, Bell, the telephone yes, man, yes, and, exactly. or any any of the the great inventors uh, were uh, held up to us as great heroes. Uh, they're practical people who really did sacrifice their lives in many ways to that idea of service. Uh, to the uh, uh, to the republic, uh, and uh, again that comes back to Cicero's whole book uh, on duties uh, has to do with this. He's trying to prevent his son from sinking into democracy, from becoming like uh, Catiline. I don't know whether on a tape recorder we have the right to use people's names. Uh, can we get uh, put in jail if we say, for example, that uh, in our time uh, uh, the great example of the, uh, of the democratic man is the Kennedys, uh, that, that is uh, uh, people who uh, were born rich, just, you know, their, their father was an oligarchic man. Yes. Uh, who, uh, as the, uh, the British lady uh, uh, who was who was horrified when old Joe Kennedy was made ambassador to the court of St. James in, in London. She said, why, he wears brown shoes, <laughs> she said. I mean, he, he was not an aristocrat. He was, not a, he, he, he was a, a tough Irish immigrant no, who made us a billion dollars. He, wasn't it brick making? I don't it, remember. It wasn't, I, I had the idea that, that there was a, his hand. there's a brickyard in there somewhere <laughs> yeah. that he find that he... he uh, uh, but, but, old, his, yeah. but his sons uh, uh, became dissolute, uh, uh, infamous for their uh, playboy uh, lives, and for their uh, uh, political uh, activity in, in raising up mobs, that is appealing to the, uh, to the mob. They're, uh, they're almost replicas of exactly the kind of thing that Cicero was terrified of. He thought, my son is going to be is going to become like that because Cicero made a lot of money and became very rich, and he thought my son is going to be he's going to go up to Harvard, and he's going to come out uh, like uh, the Kennedy boys. And so when he sent him up to college, and he sent him to Harvard, that is, he sent him to the island of Rhodes, uh, the great Greek university, which was the best of the day. And so he started immediately writing this set of letters here uh, to his son, saying now. Book one, I'm going to write you a series of letters on the virtues, and I want to make sure that you understand what they are, and why they are what they are, and how they work, and how you have to put them into practice. Yes, and uh, 
the um, uh, we 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 started off saying that uh, Cicero is a is a rhetorician. Uh, he uh, he puts his great eloquence, which is his great gift, uh, into the uh, the art of of rhetoric. He became uh, the greatest orator. Uh, who ever lived, really? Uh, the oratory uh, again it suffers it suffers a great uh, disadvantage in liter literary terms because uh, when you read those great orations, uh, they don't they don't come across very well. I, I we haven't assigned any of the orations. Uh, they they don't come across very well when you read them. These were these were orations that were delivered uh, to be heard and as writing they don't come across very well. But then Cicero is a rhetorician in everything that he does, not just in his great orations. Uh, all the things that he writes, including the, uh, the De Officiis and the uh, Tusculan Disputations, are all rhetorical. Um, we were saying uh, before we started, too, to one another that uh, that's, that's another reason that Cicero uh, is not as conspicuously attractive as uh, so many of the other writers that we have uh, discussed in this course, uh, because rhetoric is not uh, particularly memorable. Uh, if you if you go back to the passage that I read you in the beginning uh, about Epicurus, uh, where by the way what he's doing is uh, is trying to uh, uh, he's he's trying to show you what the Epicurean life is like. And he's very fair about it. He tells you, he, he sort of presents the argument uh, in, in, as, in as accurate a way as he can uh, for Epicureanism. He's honest. He, he uh, presents the case yeah. and he, honestly. He, he, uh, he gives you, what you will remember, if you do remember that passage, are the examples that he gives. You'll remember that story about Darius uh, drinking from the, the pool where there were corpses in the pool. It's, it's a very, very memorable scene, of course, taken from someone else, uh, taken from, from history. But it's those examples, uh, if anything, that you remember. Uh, the argument uh, you may not remember so well. You may not even remember the point that he was making exactly. Uh, he gives so many examples. And he goes on and, on and on and on. You finally don't remember them yeah. because he gives yeah. you five of them instead of... Yeah. Now, in the in the Tusculan Disputations, for example, I remember he retells the story of the sword of Damocles, and it's a brilliant uh, retelling of that famous story. But you know, I can't remember why he retells the story. I've forgotten that uh, the ex exact reason. Uh, I remember the moral of the story, but not especially the connection in which he uses it. Uh, or don't remember the subject of the disputation, no. for example. No. no. Uh, well, rhetoric, that's, let, let's make a statement here. I mean, really, we can put it on the table. Rhetoric is not memorable. There's no muse of rhetoric. You remember we talked about the muses and that there were nine of them and that they included poetry and history and music, astronomy dancing. and music and dance. Uh, but there's no muse of rhetoric, no inspiration. Rhetoric is invented. In fact, doesn't Cicero have a book called De Invencione? Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm sure he does. Yes. Uh, uh, that is, uh, on, you have to invent, you have to discover. Uh, just as Thomas Edison discovered the, uh, you know, the electric light, the rhetor rhetorician has to discover the argument. He has to discover the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, evidence uh, behind the case. Yeah, well, uh, there's, no, there's no muse. It does not appeal to memory and it is not memorable. That is, when the speech is over and the argument has been won, there's nothing to remember. It's topical. It has to do with now. There's a job to be done. There's a service to be performed. We win the case. And having won the case, that's it. Whereas poetry is all memory. It begins and ends in the memory. There's a, uh, uh, we say rhetoric is an art, uh, but it is, it's an art that is, uh, has more affinity with, uh, with crafts than it does with, uh, with other arts, with what we call sometimes, we sometimes we call them liberal arts. Uh, it's, the word rhetoric uh, comes from two words. One of them means word uh, in Greek. It's a Greek word. Um, 
the R H E part has to do with words uh, or utterances, and the last part of it has to do with techne, that is the art of words, uh, and that's uh, that's that's true. That's what it that's what it's all about. Um, but the 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 rhetorician is someone who learns a certain kind of craft or a certain sort of technique or method of making his point. And uh, you can be better or worse at it. You can be better trained or worse trained, and you can have better uh, natural abilities uh, or worse natural abilities. But it, it does not require inspiration. Uh, it requires <clears throat> well. It requires hard work. Hard work. Uh, and that work is always perfectly clear in the in the thing that you're reading. Now, one thing that that always spoils a uh, any any of the higher arts is any kind of awareness that uh, the person is trying to do this according to some technique. For example, when you first learn to uh, let's say you first learn to to dance, you you follow the steps. Uh, in a mechanical way, and then I think we were talking about this last time. At a certain point, uh, you you forget about the steps. You forget about the all of the techniques that you've learned. Yeah, as long music. as you say one, two, three, one, two, three, you're not dancing. You're not dancing at all. <coughs> and then at a, at a certain point, if you, if it happens, the music picks you up and carries you away, and you forget that you're dancing. And you can see that in all good dancers or good singers or in any almost any art, a, a good actor. That is, they're not conscious of the fact that they're acting or that they're singing or that they're dancing. They're not at all conscious of it. They We say, well, they do it effortlessly. They do it as if it were, they were doing it by nature. A, a good musician, we say, well, he, he seems to be playing the violin or the piano as if it were his nature rather than something he's learned. Uh, but the rhetorician never does really escape that. Well, he calls attention to himself yeah. on purpose. That, that is, he'll tell you, now I'm going to make three points, and the division of my talk is thus. And point number one, that is, he deliberately, <clears throat> self-consciously calls attention to the fact that he is making a speech. Just the opposite. Yeah, yeah. and he, there is a, uh, well, we say he, he thinks of himself as a kind of workman, <clears throat> and that uh, that working attitude prevails and, and infuses itself, uh, diffuses itself throughout his, uh, his he, work. He becomes a rhetorical personality. Uh, Cicero uh, was a, uh, he becomes almost a caricature. Uh, Caesar, for example, to contrast, because they, they were, Caesar admired Cicero a great deal. Cicero, at first, uh, was suspicious of Caesar because he thought he was one of those uh, phony Democrats and he was very much afraid of him. He came to admire him finally, came to see that Cicero, that Caesar was uh, of a different cut. But in their, their early, well all throughout their lives up until the end, uh, Cicero was very suspicious of Caesar and his enemy. Uh, but the two, uh, you could see them almost in the cartoons of the day in the newspapers of the day, the cartoonists had a very easy time with Cicero. You could, you, you, could, you could caricature him, and the reason why you could is that he himself created the caricature. He wanted to be caricatured. That is, he wanted to be instantly recognizable. When he stood up in the Senate, everybody knew who he was. Whereas Caesar <coughs> was rather a self-effacing man. Uh, he, uh, he was... Um, uh, quiet. He, he, he did make some famous speeches, incidentally, uh, yeah. uh, uh, and he was a, a great speaker, but uh, of, a, of a totally different sort. Uh, that is, uh, his, uh, his speeches were simply uh, whatever Caesar said, ipse dixit, they used to say. He says it must be right because he's Caesar. Uh, but Caesar is rather hard to caricature. You, you, uh, you can't draw a, an easy figure of him. Uh, but Cicero is, uh, has got those qualities, and the rhetorician always does. He has to be somebody who has an instant, what do they call it, uh, recognizability? Yeah, rec yeah that's uh, right. Recognition. They, yeah, they have, yeah. they, they have call it a public image. Public image, in yeah. Times, yeah. yeah. And, and they deliberately create it. Uh, 
Uh, uh, Winston Churchill is a perfect oh, yes. example of it. Yeah. He even deliberately cultivated his, his famous lisp. Someone said, why don't you take some speech courses and get rid of that thing? Because he had a slight a speech defect. And, and, and he laughed and said, well, then they wouldn't know who I was when I got up to store. And it was very effective. He, he would, uh, he didn't stumble, but he said certain sounds in a funny way. I can't, uh, I can't imitate it. But you remember that? He, had a, he did have a, a kind of speech impediment. And it became his stock and trade. You might think of actors who do this, that is, famous actors become known instantly because they play themselves in, in, every, in every part, and you get, you, know, you, you get to expect it. Let's go see a John Wayne movie, or let's go see a Humphrey Bogart movie, because you know that they are always going to be the type that they are, but, or... Let's go see a, you know, a Mae West movie, you know. <clears throat> but um, uh, there's another kind of actor who disappears behind the role, and you, you really don't know who it is. Uh, uh, for example, uh, Lawrence Olivier is rather hard to identify. Yeah, no, you can't identify uh, Lawrence uh, Olivier. He, he, he's not a, a rhetorical actor, uh, but, but there are, uh, and it may be that the best of them finally are the rhetorical ones. That is, they're the ones who become the legends. Uh, they're the ones you, you can count on. Uh, Cicero uh, was, a, was a character, a type. Uh, and we still use the word Ciceronian. <clears throat> the thing about Caesar is that there isn't any Caesarian. Uh, he's very hard to imitate. Well, he's again, he's an absolute original. <clears throat> that is uh, a real aristocrat. Who, uh, who appeared suddenly uh, and left nothing behind him because he appeared in an age when there weren't any other aristocrats around. He was, he was, uh, he was in a way, way behind his times and um, came kind of out of nowhere, as the aristocrat often does. Uh, but they, they, uh, they, they're, they're absolute originals. Um, there's, uh, they're inimitable, as we say. Whereas the uh, uh, oh, it's it's very easy to uh, do imitations of Mae West. Yeah, oh, gosh, yeah. I mean all of any of those uh, uh, those or uh, John Wayne, any of the uh, those kinds of actors. You, you could do Bogart, the caricature of oh, it. Yeah. If you're a, it's easy. if you're one of those uh, impersonators, yeah. uh, comedians yeah. who will make jokes, they, those are the ones they do all the time. Uh, because you, or for that matter, Franklin Roosevelt, or or uh, Winston Churchill, you you can make, yes. make fun of them instantly, or Adolf Hitler for that matter. Yeah. Uh, because they're types, uh, they're, they're rhetoricians. But it's uh, very, very difficult uh, to do an imitation of, uh, well, of Julius Caesar or of Lawrence Olivier. You, we'd say, well, which one do you want me to imitate? Lawrence Olivier playing Lear or Lawrence Olivier playing Hamlet? You know, they'd be two different things. He disappears uh, behind the makeup and behind the, uh, the role. Uh, whereas uh, Cicero is the uh, is the rhetorical type. Another, uh, and 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 we might say, if, if you yourself want to become a rhetorician, one of the first things you do is become a master of type. That is, typology uh, is one of the uh, instruments in the art of rhetoric. Uh, there are typical arguments, and you learn what the types are. And then you fit the uh, situation into the type, and you work by type. That is, you, you know that your audience is made up of, you, you divide your audience up into segments. Are they rich people? Are they poor people? Are they young people? Are they old people? Are they middle-aged people? And immediately you have in your mind a certain typical old person, typical young person, and then you direct your speech to the type. So that uh, uh, typology, or uh, typifying things, is part and parcel of the whole uh, concept of what uh, rhetoric is. Uh, poetry does not work by types. There's a, a tremendous dispute about this in the literary world, which uh, Mr. Quinn and I have both, uh, alas, lived through. Uh, uh, a lot of critics took up rhetoric and made some attempt to apply it to poetry. I suppose that's, that fad has finally gone out. But you yeah. remember for 20 years there, that was the thing to do, and it was wrong. Just, uh, that is, uh, uh, Odysseus is, is not type. 
he, he, is, he, he doesn't really fit. Uh, uh, there was some attempt to turn Shakespeare into a rhetorician. Now he makes use of rhetoric, certainly makes use of it uh, in his plays, but uh, finally when you get all through with it, uh, you can't uh, make sense out of Shakespeare's plays by saying things like, King Lear is the type of the old uh, king. I, I, I remember mm. reading books mm. that said that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. You could understand Macbeth as the type of ambition. Yeah. Uh, it simply isn't true. Uh, uh, Shakespeare makes use of, well, you knew a lot about rhetoric and makes use of it, but that's not what it is. Uh, but rhetoric deals with the caricature of an idea, with the uh, with the typification of it, because that's what's effective. That's what gets the idea across. Uh, what a what a marvelous uh, art it is, and uh, and how I guess, I guess I'll have to contradict myself. Finally, I was just about to say how admirable. <laughs> maybe, maybe finally it is admirable. You know, that is in our day. An honest man is an admirable thing. That, that is, when you come across a man like Winston Churchill, you, you finally do say, uh, wow, you're in awe of him. Because he stands so far above the democratic the crowd. That, uh, that typical extravagant behavior, it has to be extravagant. Uh, uh, gestures are wide and grand and broad. Uh, but you do have to uh, compare it uh, to what we have uh, in the streets, I think you do have to you do have to stand in, in awe of it. Yeah, well, we it's almost uh, impossible for us to even conceive of, of what rhetoric uh, to Cicero and his contemporaries was, uh, because we just don't have it anymore at all. You have we, to go back in time. We have demagoguery. Find it. We have demagoguery, and then we have. Uh, we have hype, yeah, advertising. Yeah, we, we have advertising, and, and that, of course, is what, and, and then you do get political. That's, that's the decadence of Speechifying. Yeah. But it's, uh, that's not rhetoric. Oh, somebody else writes the speech. You know, just the other day, there was a big scandal in the American newspapers because some uh, young fellow uh, wanted to run for president, and he put his hat, as they say, in the ring. Isn't that what the way they put it? Or is it in the pit? But anyway, he threw in his hat, and he was going to run for president, and then they caught him grossly plagiarizing, word for word, plagiarizing uh, somebody else's speech. And a I British, heard, British politician. Uh, a British politician, who apparently was very good. Yeah. Uh, and I heard a commentator say, well, why blame him for that? After all, everybody plagiarizes. Roosevelt didn't write his own speeches. And you know, your heart sinks in a way. And you say, gee, you know, that, that oh, by golly, Winston Churchill wrote his own speeches. Or Cicero, boy, he wrote his own speeches. Uh, that is, there is something frightening about the, uh, the machine-made politician, that phony rhetorician who has a whole uh, stable of speech writers uh, who you know, turn out what uh, phrases. And uh, the point this commentator was making is, what does the charge of pledgers mean in a world where everybody hires speech writers? They're all pledgers. I think there's a certain... Yeah, proof that's, that. yeah, that's a certain logic. Logic, anyway. Yes, we, we, we have to defend Cicero, and uh, we have to uh, defend uh, the art of, of rhetoric. Uh, it is a, a, a great thing. I think that the uh, what's happened, of course, with, with modern demagoguery, or with uh, another term to use is modern sophistry. Um, somebody the other day... Uh, I was reading something, and uh, they pointed out that uh, uh, Nietzsche once said, uh, the age of the sophist, our age, he said. It's a marvelous, <laughs> marvelous phrase that he has. And very true, very true. Yeah. I, uh, he, he's a bad guy, but he was, <laughs> he, he was inspired. He was, he was inspired. inspired. Yeah, that, that's poetry. That's not rhetoric. He wasn't a rhetorician or a philosopher, I think, yeah. but a poet. Uh, but it is true. It is true. Ours is an age of sophistry. And the, the sophist, uh, one of the things that the sophist does is to, uh, is to separate uh, the truth from the word. That is, 
uh, he is interested in the manipulation of words. The art of rhetoric uh, becomes purely the art of words and the art of, of making effects without a regard to the truth. And that is not rhetoric at all. That's not rhetoric. That's no, not rhetoric. That's often, sophistry. It's that's often sophistry. called. So that's, what, that's what's often confused yeah. with rhetoric. I've heard uh, people, again, in, in the political life today, they'll say, oh, well, uh, yeah, he, he put a lot of rhetoric into that. Yeah. And, and that's a total abuse of, of, the, of the great... We don't, we don't want to hear all that rhetoric, yeah. they say, as, as if rhetoric has nothing to do with the truth. Well, uh, alas, uh, that is the confusion that prevails in our times. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the things that Cicero was very conscious of, if you, if you were to read some of his treatises, he has a treatise on the orator, uh, he has several treatises on oratory, and I, re I can't remember which treatise it is that begins with the question, uh, should rhetoric be permitted at all? Should it be permitted at all? Because it is so dangerous, it is so subject to abuse, and it has such power over the minds and hearts of, of the public. Plato had first raised that question, yes. and um, yes. well, Cicero had read him and right. the, reflected uh, on that. Uh, the Gorgias of, uh, of Cicero, of uh, Plato, uh, is a dialogue uh, between Socrates and, and the, uh, a, a young rhetorician, who is a sophist, I should add, uh, and, and not really a rhetorician. But he's, he was what the day had. Our, our day is very much like their day. That's, what, that's of course, what Nietzsche meant. Uh, it's, uh, he was, the sophists, of course, were those, those were the people who were the deadly enemies of Socrates, who were really responsible for having him executed. And uh, they were the uh, leading um, uh, educators of their day. Uh, I use educators in quotation marks when I say that, but they, they really were. They dominated the field. And um, you would say uh, that our age is very much like that age in that respect, that we are ours an age of sophistry where, where words are merely instruments of power and uh, they're used in complete disregard uh, to the truth. The uh, 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 a better definition there, or a real definition of rhetoric, would always include the truth. You could say that rhetoric is the art of words uh, whose end is to make uh, effective or convincing or persuasive uh, the truth, uh, to articulate in a, in a persuasive way the truth. Now, you have to qualify that a little bit. Uh, the, the, uh, the orator or the rhetorician is in the field of public affairs. He's in the political order. And therefore, he's dealing with uh, truth in a, uh, in a uh, certain way. That is, he's dealing with probable truth, we say. He's not a philosopher. He's not, he's not attempting to make demonstrations which uh, of eternal truths. As Mr. Senior pointed out, he deals with the, the, the the immediate affairs of the day. Uh, it comes down to the question of whom should we vote for uh, in this election? Who is the better man uh, that we should cast our vote for? The, the rhetorician, the orator, is a man who comes before uh, the public and makes a speech to try to persuade you that his candidate is the best candidate, the candidate uh, that he is praising is the best man. Uh, now, that is not an area where you can have uh, absolute certainty. You're dealing with probabilities rather than certainties. But one thing you should notice is that behind uh, though that idea of the probable truth, this is all discussed again in the Republic, uh, where he distinguishes the various kinds of knowledge uh, that are possible. Uh, behind the, uh, that effort to prove, to, to make a convincing case for some particular issue or some particular candidate, uh, there are those principles. That is, you have to have certain principles in order to be able to do that as a rhetorician. For one thing, you have to, you have to know and accept uh, the principles of logic. Uh, you have to uh, you have to accept all of the uh, all of the principles that are taught in Plato and Aristotle uh, as 
underlying the principles of reasoning. You have to believe in the ability of reason to reach the truth at all, uh, even in a limited way. Uh, but the sophist is a, uh, an absolute relativist who doesn't really believe that you can reach the truth at all and that there are no principles of truth. And that's that's the, the, uh, the attitude that afflicts uh, uh, the whole modern world as we know it, <clears throat> where you have a complete loss of faith in the ability of reason to arrive at the truth. Uh, and a complete relativity about the truth, so that uh, the uh, the uh, under those circumstances, the orator or the rhetorician is just a person who manipulates, uh, who uses language and the devices of the media uh, to uh, to uh, win people over. By, That's a by by means of, uh, of, of That's just, un, just unprincipled power. rhetoric. Unprincipled rhetoric. So, well, one of the great pieces of rhetoric in, in our American history is the one that begins: "We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal." And so forth. That is, uh, there have to be self-evident truths, otherwise the rhetoric uh, uh, yeah. can't work. It, it, That's assumed. It's assumed. That's always assumed. You know, if you if you go back and read uh, Aristotle's rhetoric. He doesn't talk about those those principles. They're taken for granted. Uh, you have to read the whole works of Aristotle. You can't pick and choose. Very often people start at the end and they read the poetics and the, and the rhetoric, which were the last things that he wrote. But you have to read the whole foundation, which is all of the logical works and all of the metaphysical works that precede those, uh, those works about rhetoric and, and politics and, uh, and poetics. Uh, because all of the... All, the, the principles that are there in all those other works are taken for granted. Uh, the principles that have to do with the truth and the means of reaching the truth. The uh, <clears throat> poetry and philosophy uh, have a better press. Again, especially among young people, I suppose we're used to, Mr. Quinn and I are used to talking to people of college age. And uh, as we said, uh, a little while ago, Cicero always has to be defended. Uh, poetry never has to be, really, never has to be defended. Uh, there have been quite a few defenses of poetry written, some very, very famous ones. Uh, but really, uh, nobody has ever taken them very seriously. Uh, that is, Plato's famous attack on the poets uh, is something of a joke. Nobody believes it, and I don't think Plato believed it. That is, everybody knows that poetry is a marvelous thing. Sure, there are bad poets, but the poetry itself is a marvelous thing. And in, the, in English literature, we have Sir Philip Sidney's famous defense of dramatic poesy and Shelley's famous defense of poetry. And I think w when you actually sit down and read those things, what you, what you realize is that they're, uh, they're, they're exercises. Mm -hmm. uh, they really didn't have to be done. Uh, any good poem uh, would, would be better. But, uh, and philosophy too, I think everybody admits the importance of, of philosophy, its depth, we always talk about it, its great you know, profundity. But rhetoric is in the middle somewhere, and uh, it, does, it does have to be defended. The, um, uh, I don't know, I think I said a, a moment ago uh, that there's a time of life when you just get tired uh, of philosophy, for example. Uh, philosophers can absolutely drive you nuts. They think all the time. They think about everything. I have never met a philosopher who ever concluded definitively to anything. That is, they always see some other possible train of thought that hasn't yet been examined. And, uh, and I mean good philosophers, uh, uh, they're doing their job, but their job is to think, and always to think and to think. Yeah, well, as, as uh, someone, as, as has been said often by, by various people, philosophy is a way of life. Yeah. It, isn't, it isn't the construction of a system, oh, no. an airtight <laughs> system. People have tried that. People course, have accused but, Aristotle, for example, yeah, of no, being an Aristotelian, and it's not true. If you, well, the first thing you see about Aristotle's works is they're not finished. Uh, he, he never got to the definitive 
Aristotelian position. That can only be done by a rhetorician. It cannot be done by, by a philosopher. Well, I, I've heard it said of, of Hegel, for example, and I'm sure it's true. But on the other hand, when you pick up Hegel, you, you don't get that feeling from sitting down and trying to read him that he has a system. I know he does have one, but <laughs> well, I must say, when I sit down to read him, it's very hard to, to see what it is, you know. He has that same kind of mind. Always, always going on to think about other things, to consider further this question. I've had the experience of, of, of talking to philosophers and being, uh, uh, sometimes in my life anyway, a kind of tr trying anyway to be amiable, S sitting down and having lunch with a philosopher and saying things like, well, you know, I read your book and I agreed with you when you said such and such. And they say, oh, really? Well, well, I'm not so sure about that, and pretty soon you find you're in an argument with them about what you thought was was their idea. You, you can never agree with a philosopher. He, he'll always find some grounds uh, for undercutting you. I think Socrates is that way. I think Socrates exasperated people. You, you, you can't agree with Socrates about anything. He'll always find a, a question uh, which will get the, the thing going again uh, in order to discover something more. Uh, and there is a time in life when you cease to be a youth and you hit the age of the proverbial age of 35 at least and you, you put the, the philosophy down and you say you know we've got a job to do a duty to perform we have a war to win or we have a uh, political agenda and if we don't get this established there won't be any philosophers, there won't be any poets. That is, somebody has to make the trains run. Somebody has to do the work of the world. And you move in to this dimension of rhetoric. And uh, I don't know, as an older man now looking back on it, I do uh, see it as a kind of marvelous gift. That is, there are people who are rhetoricians and they get the job done. Philosophers, uh, oh, it, it, Plato's idea of the philosopher king is one of the worst ideas I think anybody's ever had in the whole history of the world. And uh, for that matter, uh, Julius Caesar, as the almost the embodiment of the philosopher king, uh, is good for about an hour. That's as long as he lasted. That is, he got the job done, but then he had to give it over to, to Cicero. As I think everybody admits that the, the great Roman achievement, the Pax Romana, that lasted for 500 years, was originally the, the, the vision of Julius Caesar and the act of Julius Caesar. That is, he acted, but the 500 years was done by the, uh, by the Roman uh, Ciceronian uh, politician. I just read the, uh, uh, yesterday I just read and taught uh, the apology of, of Socrates before the jury. And uh, you remember, one of the things that he says in there is that uh, he, he stayed out of politics. He said because his voice told him to. But uh, he did go into politics once, he said. When he was young, he went into politics. And he said that the very first thing that happened was that he found himself on the other side against... A, a majority, a very strong majority, about something that was to be done. And uh, they did it, uh, and he stood up against them, he, and he refused. He said, no, this is against my principles. I will not vote for this. This is dishonest, and I won't vote for it. And he said the same thing happened again uh, a second time, and he said it, he realized then that his career would be very short if he continued in the, in, the, in the political life. In other words, the, the philosopher uh, who insists on always acting on principle uh, finds himself very often in the position of being completely against everybody. <laughs> and eventually they kill him. You know, he said, well, I, he said, I would have died very young. See, he's 70 years old. He said, he's very funny, of course. He said, I, I saw that I was going to die. I'd be killed in, in my youth. 
if I continue. And he finally on, was. Yeah. <laughs> well, the he, whole point. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But he he said, you know, in philosophy, you can do that. You can stand up for principle as long as you want to, and you can argue about it as long as you want to, because it does not have anything to do with the particular affairs of this moment. Uh, Cicero uh, was a man who died. He did die eventually for his principles, but not until he had served a very long life. Uh, as a politician. And we all know that politicians do make compromises. They say, well, my principles are so-and-so, and and this case uh, goes against my principles. But, you know, uh, this is the thing that we obviously have to do. Uh, even if it is against my principles, it isn't necessarily an evil thing to do, but I, uh, it isn't the way I would, I would really prefer to do it. But they, they say, well, but under these circumstances, this is what we have to do. That's they that, do uh, compromise. That committee work, that sitting up yeah. all night. And, yeah. and, and uh, one, of the, one of the characteristics of the, of the rhetorician is that he is a, uh, a friendly man. Uh, a lot has been made about the isolation of the uh, poet and the philosopher. And I think something is to be made of that. That is, uh, uh, poets are um, work alone. Now they they may have friends, but they're not friendly men. Uh, you can you can look at the the famous uh, portrait of Shakespeare, for example, uh, and you look into those eyes, and you realize that you could never be. Uh, you could never penetrate to a man like that. Uh, so, suppose you were Shakespeare's friend. Uh, you, you would never know him. He, he's an, an enigma. Uh, he, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know anything about Homer. I remember um, Mark Van Doren once saying that one of the greatest paradoxes in the world, and he just chuckled and thought it was wonderful, is that we don't know anything at all about the private life of the two greatest poets who ever lived. We know nothing about Shakespeare, and we know nothing about Homer. And and that's true. Uh, But we know everything about Cicero. Uh, That is, uh, he was a man. Well, he wrote a whole book called Friendship. He's a public uh, public man. Public man. (laughs) man. But but he liked people. That is, you cannot be a public man if you don't like people. Uh, Politicians like to shake hands. You know, you say, oh, gee, what an awful life you have to... Uh, stop at whistle stops and uh, kiss babies, kiss and babies. Shake hands, yeah. but they like to kiss babies. They like to shake hands. They like to go to parties. They're party men. I'm making a pun here, play on words, but I don't think it's any accident that those two words. No, they even like their they even like their committee meetings. Yeah, they like they like, they they like all yeah. that. Those smoke filled rooms. Yeah. They tell yeah. they they live on they that live smoke. They, live yeah. <laughs> they really do. Now again, uh, Julius Caesar didn't like it. He had to do it. Uh, but uh, he he uh, he was too proud. Right? You know, he he thought really uh, that was interfering with his. Uh, with There's his, no need to talk to all these people all these about people. this. I know the right thing exactly. to do, and I'm going to do it. <laughs> that is one of the one of the most wonderful qualities of the uh, of the rhetorician is that he he is he has to be finally uh, a uh, a sanguine man or a likable a likable. Man. I mean, look at Lucretius. Lucretius is a great poet. We're, we're totally opposed to his philosophy, but no one would deny that Lucretius uh, was a great poet, but almost the epitome of the loner uh, sitting there. Sitting there in his tower. In his tower. Glowering down there at the whole world saying, ha, I'm better off than you are. And to some extent, that's true even of the poets who are not Epicureans. That is, uh, as I say, of, of a man like Shakespeare, who's a very strange, maybe that's the right word, there's something strange. They're not part of the crowd. Uh, when they go to a party, they don't say much. They usually uh, they kind of observe what the others are doing. Well, he had a great uh, reputation for wit. As, with, at, yes, at yeah. parties, maybe, maybe uh, yeah. same. Yeah. Uh, ben Johnson spoke of it often. That uh, mm-hmm. he said he, he was he was a, he was marvelous company. No, yeah, he, he was said. he was marvelous company. But uh, but I had the fe- I have the feeling Ben Johnson that, never understood him. Yeah, no, I had the feeling that that was as great as Johnson. Johnson is a marvelous poet himself. But uh, 
John Johnson ne never really penetrated against. No, no, I don't think it. I don't think it was that sort of thing. I think he was a man who who was uh, capable of uh, of great warmth and oh, yeah, affection I don't mean and no, no. Uh, and uh, uh, even even a kind of bon vivant, if you want, uh, at a uh, among his friends. Yes. But, uh, but you, you, you still circle. you don't get the idea again that it was uh, that he ever revealed his secret thoughts or anything like that. But ben Johnson never even suggests anything no, like no, that. No. Uh, he just says he was he was a very witty, charming, uh, funny kind of man who could just go on and on and on talking, you know. But uh, that uh, he, he doesn't say anything about that, but that dark in our, deeper side. You know, in our own time, for example, T.S. Eliot is a, is, a, is a famous and very, very good poet. And uh, he wrote a play. He wrote several plays. I don't happen to remember them all. But he wrote a, a, one of his plays about this very question. He called it The Cocktail Party, in which uh, he, he proposes that maybe the, the, uh, the, the rhetorician is better than the poet. That is maybe giving a good cocktail party and being a good lawyer. The hero of the play is a lawyer. Mm. And Eliot, rather wistfully, as the poet, uh, sits aside as the stranger at the party mm. and says rather wistfully, you know, these are the men who are leading the good life. 